are live. Aaron Boster here from the Boster Center of Multiple Sclerosis. It is just seconds before 6.30 p.m. on this wonderful December 23rd, 2021, finishing up the year. This is our last live stream of the year, the December live stream. I am so excited for all of you to join us. My name is Aaron Boster. If you're coming on, please share where you're traveling in from in this virtual world. Tell us where you're calling from. I love watching this global, glowing online village grow and grow. It's really, really awesome. Tonight, I have some really exciting things planned for us. You may have noticed that the live stream looks a little bit different. I've been working diligently trying to learn this new software, so I would love your feedback on what you think of the setup. We'll see how things go tonight. As always, we've got our MS Water Challenge at the ready. Please make sure that you have a glass of water, and when I drink, you drink, you know how it goes. MS Water Challenge, guys, let's drink up. Ah, that's good stuff. I have a couple fun functionalities here. MS Water Challenge. And I can put that on the screen, I think. Let's try this out. MS Water Challenge. Did it work? Yeah, it did. Super fun, guys. So tonight, I've got a lot of fun things planned for us. A couple updates for clinic at the MS Center. There's a lot going on. I want to make a couple comments on COVID and give you some updates. I'm going to be trying out some new functionality on a live stream. We're going to try watching some of my YouTube videos together where I'll play them on the live stream and then we can talk about it together. I'm kind of excited about that. And I'm really, really looking forward to you guys giving me tips about how the live stream's going as this is kind of a whole brand new setup for me. I also want to discuss a couple research articles that I think are very, very germane to MS and to our daily lives. And so I'll be touching on that. And then we'll wrap up the, the end of the live stream with a live Q&A. So without further ado, let's get started. And I would like to begin sort of just by giving you some updates about clinic. So Boster Center MS Clinic Updates. I'm still getting used to all this functionality, guys. So uh, uh, it's the end of the year, and for any of you that are involved in receiving an infusion or receiving uh, botulinum toxin injections or some other type of therapy, January is always a very, very challenging time because we have to go through all the research, recertifications, excuse me, insurance, etc. So if you are a member of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis and you're having an insurance change, if you're having a change of address, please, please make sure to send us that information ASAP so that there's no lapse in your care and everything moves on smoothly. That's a really important thing, particularly for those patients that are receiving MS infusions. And that would apply to anywhere in the world, actually, or anywhere in the United States, at least. But definitely, if you're one of our patients, help us by giving us that information really early on so that we can make sure that there's no lapse in your care. In March, it will be exactly two years since we started the Boster Center for MS. I can't believe it. It's been quite a whirlwind. Uh, we opened on March 19th, 2020. And just as the global viral pandemic kicked in, it's now been almost two years. We've been growing. It's terribly, terribly exciting. There's a lot of exciting things going on. And I'm delighted to share with you guys that we have some construction. We're redoing our lobby. We're building it out. We're also creating a couple new clinic spaces so that we can continue to care for families and keep people private and not on top of one another. So if you happen to be in the center this month, December, the beginning of January, you may notice our construction and dust, and I apologize for that. MS Water Challenge, everybody. Drink up. A couple words about COVID. COVID-19 has been going on now for two years and there's a risk that we can become fatigued with COVID-19. Um, we can become fatigued with the need to wear masks all the time uh, and to distance and not see our loved ones and friends and family. And I, I want to convey to you very sincerely that it's not over yet. COVID-19 is still a, a very, very serious global viral pandemic. And if you're listening to me right now, I want you to be three for three in your fight against COVID-19. Three, four, three, and your fight against COVID-19. 
What does it mean to be three for three? Being three for three against COVID-19 involves number one, being boosted. And so if you received a vaccine, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, what we've learned is that all of the vaccines tend to wane in their efficacy over time. And the recommendations from uh, multiple government agencies and from the National Medicine Society as well, is that six months after your Pfizer or Moderna that you should have a booster shot. Having a booster is a really, really important tool because the vaccine gives you an immunity, but that immunity starts to wear down over several months. And so number one in being three for three in your fight against COVID-19 is to make sure that you're boosted. I got my booster a couple weeks ago. I'm really, really glad that I did. I wanna stay protected for my patients, for myself, for my family. So please, I urge you to get boosted. If you have specific questions about your medical situation, your MS, your MS uh, medicines, and how they may interact with a COVID-19 booster, definitely ask your MS neurologist or ask your general neurologist about that. It's a very, very important discussion to have. Now, in being three for three, I want you to be boosted. Number two is I want you to be masked. Right, so you can find masks just about anywhere in the universe right now. Anytime you walk into a store, they have some ready for you. We have a million billion right when you walk into clinic. And wearing a mask is very, very important. Wearing a mask is one of the ways that you can help protect yourself and protect others. And so I would strongly recommend that you're masked when you're not in your home. If you're in a public space, whether that be in private or in public, I would wear a mask. When you go to a restaurant, I would wear a mask and take it off to eat and then put it back on. So as we strive to be three for three in our fight against COVID-19, I need you to be boosted and I need you to be masked. That's very, very important. Number three of being for three for three is to stay out of the fray. It is not time to get together in big groups. I know that we're all getting tired. I mean, heck, we're about to celebrate some very serious holidays and there's such a strong desire for us all to be together, uh, to be with friends and family, uh, to spend time together, and we have to be very, very cautious. I still think that the better part of Valor is to make sure that you're staying within your bubble. This is not a time to go to a big holiday party. I'm very, very concerned about what we might see uh, with large gatherings. So I urge you to be three for three in your fight against COVID-19. Now, a couple comments about MS medicines in specific, but first, MS Water Challenge, guys. I've included a little functionality here. Let me see if I can do this blast. Ready for some fire? I hope you think that's half as fun as I did. It took me probably 25 minutes to figure out how to do that. Some of the MS medicines create a problem in mounting a immune response to the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, of course, we had no way of knowing this because the medicines came out before COVID came out and as it turns out, there are some serious situations that we can run ourselves into. If you're taking a B cell depleter, so that would be a drug like Kesempta, Rituximab, Ocrelizumab, those medicines are outstanding MS drugs. They work really, really well to treat MS, and I love using them. But if you've been on them, particularly if you've been on them for more than, say, a year or so, we can run into a situation where when you get vaccinated, you mount a T cell response but you don't mount a B cell response. And so you don't mount antibodies. And that's a very serious issue. And so if you are receiving a B cell depleter, we still very much want you to get vaccinated. It's important that you're vaccinated because we want you to have C T cell immunity. You need to have T cell immunity. If you have T cell immunity, you're gonna be able to fight off COVID much better. But you, you may be suppressed in your ability to mount B cells and to mount antibodies and hence the strong importance of wearing a mask, hence the strong importance of staying out of the fray. Beyond the B cell depleters, we have very similar problems with some of the S1P1 receptor modulators. So these are drugs like Gelinia, Zyposia, Ponvoy, and Mazent. Those are fantastic pills to treat MS, very effective drugs in treating relapsing MS, particularly early on in the disease, but if you're taking those drugs, they can interfere with both a B cell and a T cell response to COVID. Now, you can't stop those drugs cold turkey because there's a small risk of a rebound phenomenon. And so I desperately want you to be talking to your MS neurologist 
about the best ways to proceed if you're on one of those medicines. It is still important to get a vaccination. I want you to wear a mask pretty, pretty please and stay out of the fray. So those are some of my updates about COVID-19. Now, there, one of the viewers today has asked a few times about Shield, And I can't find your, there you are. Um, so Mark said, what about Shield?" And Mark, I am excited to share. Um, I also was really struck by that. And so here's another scene in my live stream. I'm so excited that worked. And I've set this up so that you and I can talk about a new offering, a new medication, which may help people with MS who are immunosuppressed and unable to mount full vaccine responses. So this drug, Evusheld, is brand new. I'm not even sure that you can get it yet in a pharmacy, or at least as of earlier this week, uh, my team was not able to. This is, a, this is not a, a vaccine in the traditional sense. It is not. It is a monoclonal antibody. And in fact, it's two monoclonal antibodies that are combined. It's an injection that you take once. And what it intends to do is it provides prophylaxis against COVID-19. It's not for most people. It's for people that are immunosuppressed and unable to mount full responses. Now, what you see on the screen right now is a uh, correspondence put out by the National MS Society earlier this week. And I'm gonna read it to you. The US FDA has authorized Evishield as a medicine to prevent COVID-19 in some people 12 years or older. The prevention medicine is strictly for those who are not expected to have an adequate immune response to the vaccine or have a severe allergy to the vaccine. And many, many of our patients on medications like I just listed fit that bill. As COVID-19 variants continue to emerge, it's not known how effective this Evishield will be against those variants. Vaccines have proven to be the best defense. And that's highlighted because this is not something to do instead of receiving a vaccine. This is something to do if we're concerned your vaccine won't work for you. And so they're reminding us that we still wanna make sure that you're vaccinated. Evishield is not a substitute for vaccination and we still want you to get vaccinated. Now, the studies that have looked at the vaccine response in people with MS, as I just shared with you, have not all been rosy. Some of the MS medicines, as I mentioned, medicines like Jelinia, Mazent, Zaposia, and Ponvoy, you see listed there, and the, anti, the B cell depleters, Ocrevus, Casempta, Rituximab, they can inhibit your ability to mount a response. You also see listed there Limtrada, and particularly during the first couple months after Limtrada, the first three months, you have a relative immunosuppression. And so I wanted to bring this medicine to your attention, write down the name, Evushield, and it's something to talk about with your MS neurologist, particularly if you're on one of those medicines. Now, again, more to come as we learn more about this medicine and the ways to apply it, we will be able to give you updates, but I was very, very excited to bring you that information hot off the presses this week. Now, what I would like to try to do now is take a couple questions, all right? So I'm gonna change things up a bit. I'm gonna go back to my main screen and I'm gonna spend a few minutes, guys, if you wanna ask me anything, ask me about MS, Let's spend a few minutes taking some questions before we launch into the next section of the live stream. So the chat is open. I am excited for the first question. Mark, you're very welcome. Go ahead and hit me with your first question and we'll try to answer it. So MS Dude writes, is there any reason not to take Evishield? So, and he says, are there side effects? And so I would expect that there are side effects. I would never tell you that a medicine doesn't have side effects, although I'm not familiar with the side effect profile of this drug just yet. This drug is not something that you would take if you mount a normal vaccine response. And so let's pretend that you have MS and you're taking, say, Tecfidera, all right? Tecfidera is not going to, to inhibit your ability to have a, a vaccine response. So you have MS, you're on Tecfidera, you get your COVID vaccine and that will protect you. You still wear a mask and stay out of the fray, but you don't need Evishield. It's not, it's not appropriate for that patient. This is appropriate for someone with MS who's been vaccinated but doesn't mount a full response because they're on a medicine like Jelinia or Ponvoy or Mazent or, or they're on a medicine like uh, Rituximab or Ocrevus or Kisemta. 
And this medicine is going to be added on after they're vaccinated to help protect them. That was a great question. Thank you for asking it. So this next question comes from Tyler, who says, is, the, is there great success in hematopoietic stem cell transplant? And where do you do it in the United States? So this is a very, very hot topic. Uh, and there probably isn't a, a day in clinic that goes by where someone doesn't ask me questions about stem cell transplantation. Stem cell transplantation is uh, not a drug. It's not a medicine that you receive. It's a procedure. And it's a very, very serious procedure. It's done in the confines of a very important safe hospital environment. And the first step is they, they take out stem cells. So oftentimes they'll take stem cells from you. They have to give you special medicines to mobilize the stem cells in your blood. Then they pull them out and they put them on ice. Then they murder you. They give you lethal doses of either chemotherapy or sometimes radiation, and they ablate your immune system. So they lymphoablate. You have no immune response. So if we stopped right there, you would succumb to infection. You'd die. But before you die, thank God, they give you back your immune system, and then they pray that it takes, and you have a baby's immune system. You need to get all your immunizations and vaccinations again. And the idea behind this hematopoietic stem cell transplant is to reboot your immune response, to start with a whole new immune response. Now, this is a procedure that is dangerous and it needs to be done in a very, very careful environment. Here in the United States, it is not prime time. It's not approved by the FDA for MS. It is done in the context of research. Right now, for example, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, they're doing a really great and very appropriate stem cell transplant study where they're trying to do some transplants. Uh, when I was a professor at Ohio State, I was also involved in a stem cell transplant trial called the HALT trial. Uh, where we did a stem cell transplant in four patients. It is not prime time, and I want to caution you about something very, very concerning called, uh, be, let me write this out, beware of stem cell tourism. So let's see if I can put that on the screen. Yeah, that's so fun. So stem cell tourism is a major issue right now, and the American FDA is cracking down on it within the United States, uh, but there, there's still a lot of stem cell tourism going on outside the United States. And I'll give you an example. A patient of mine, a very nice young lady, um, I, I saw her on telemedicine today. And on telemedicine, I said, hey, how's your drug going? She goes, well, I stopped it about six months ago. I said, you did? Why didn't you tell me? She said, I didn't think about it. Um, and then I said, well, do you want to talk about starting a new MS medicine? And she said, well, I don't think I need any more medicines. And I said, why? And she said, well, because I had a stem cell transplant. And I was really taken aback. Um, and so I said, well, where? So it turns out that she went to Tijuana, Mexico, and she paid over $10,000. And they did a procedure, but my fear is they didn't do a real stem cell transplant. She was only there for about an hour, as opposed to a month or two. They didn't do a conditioning regimen. It wasn't done um, in a proper environment. And they just injected her belly with some what they said was stem cells. So I'm still waiting to receive the protocol so that I can best understand what they did to her, but she's out a lot of money and my strong fear is that that's not gonna help her. And so stem cell transplantation is exciting, it's evolving, it's emerging as something really potentially valuable, particularly for very aggressive MS, but it is not prime time. And I ask you to please, please not consider doing it uh, where you fly down to some exotic place like Mexico or uh, India and then have it done. Uh, there's some serious concerns there. And if that's something you want to pursue, please bring it up to your MS neurologist so that we can help guide you and make sure that whatever is going to be done is done safely. So here's a question that I really like. Now, Darla, our moderator, kind of cued this up. Um, Gianna asked, does Limtrata differ from uh, stem cells? So Limtrata and stem cell transplantation are in fact quite different. A stem cell transplant, in my mind, if I use a computer analogy, is kind of like when you open up the computer and you take out the motherboard and you throw it out, and then you take a new motherboard and put it into the computer. So you have re, you've, you've replaced the motherboard with a different motherboard. And that's kind of like a stem cell transplant where you literally remove the immune response and then you, re, you replace it with a different immune response. Now, Limtrata is more like when you hit Control-Alt-Delete and you reboot your computer. It's a soft reboot. So Limtrata is not a procedure like stem cell transplantation. Limtrata is a drug that you take, right? And you, you receive this drug, 
And what it does is, is it identifies your adult BNT cells and it knocks them out of play and it forces them to grow back more well-behaved. So in my mind, the closest thing to a stem cell transplant that's currently FDA approved is Lemtrada. Lemtrada is not without its own side effects and risk, of course, um, but I think that's a really, really uh, relevant question. Thank you for asking it. So let's take one more question before we jump into the next section of the live stream. Uh, looking through here, let me see. There's been some great questions. So here's one from Amanda Seibert who writes, how long can you take ocrelizumab? I notice my immunoglobulins are low. IgG is low normal. I also notice my white blood cell count is low. So Amanda, the medicine ocrelizumab, which is an infusion in the vein done twice a year, is intended to be taken forever. So it's not intended for a set period of time. And I'm gonna keep you on your MS medicine, no matter what medicine it is, as long as there's five things that are going on. I wanna make sure that you're not failing the litmus test of life, right? So if you're stepping away from soccer practices with your kids because you can't walk across the grass, you're failing the litmus test of life, that's not okay. You're not having attacks, that's important. You're not having new spots on your MRI, that's important. You're not having change on your neurological examination. And here's the big one. The safety and tolerability of your drug remains cool in the gang. So you give some examples where the IgG has dropped, presumably because you're on Ocrevus. And that has been associated in some people with an increased risk of infection. It's important to point out it's not statistically significant. And so if I see that you have a low IgG level, if you don't have other concerning risk factors and you're otherwise a relatively young, healthy person, I'm not going to take you off the drug. Um, again, if you are responding to your therapy, you're not having attacks, you're not having worsening on your exam, your MRIs are stable, you're tolerating your therapy, you're not failing a litmus test of life, I'm going to keep you on Ocrevus or whatever that drug is as long as we can run that out, years and years. Thank you for asking that question. All right, guys, that was super fun. Thank you very much for letting me do a little Q&A action. We're going to change things up and... What I would like to do now, at least I'm going to try, is I'm going to show you uh, some of the videos that I made over the past month. So my hope here is that we'll play the video. This first one's just a couple minutes long. And then I'm going to kind of talk through it a little bit. And afterwards, I'd like to take your questions. I've, I've wanted to do this for a long time with you guys where we could kind of share some of my content and discuss it. So let's try this out and kind of see how it goes. So... What exactly should you eat if you have multiple sclerosis? Don't turn away so, because I'm going to answer that question bit. starting right now. Hey. Howdy, and thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. There's a lot of information about diet that's Somebody available for MS. Some sound. of it is steeped in research. Some of it is someone's random opinion, it would appear. Today's video is not about reviewing those diets. If you would Very like cool. to learn about the Swank diet or the Overcoming MS Protocol, etc., I'm actually going to recommend that you check out my friend's channel, Dr. Brandon Bieber. So I'll try to throw a link up there and you can check out some really fantastic videos that he's done analyzing those diets. Instead, in this video, it's my intention to talk to you about what I recommend to my patients and the families that I help take care of here in Columbus, Ohio, as it relates to diet and nutrition. So let's jump in. Now, For starters, video, so we want to up your it. water game. Um, but I'm gonna Most red-blooded Americans run around dehydrated. About it. And dehydration um, has a remarkable impact on MS, bigger than you might actually realize. For example, people who start to adequately hydrate find they're not as tired. So think about that. The most common symptom in MS, fatigue, can be improved, in fact, if you're not dehydrated. Beyond that, it helps your bladder health. If you avoid water, you don't make urine problems with MS better, you actually make them worse. You leave very, very concentrated, scant amount of urine in your bladder. It's a great place for bacteria to grow, and it's quite a bladder irritant, and it's gonna contribute to overactive bladder symptoms. Conversely, if you're doing a rock star job of drinking water, you're constantly flushing your bladder. You're diluting the toxins, you're washing out the bacteria. So I could go on for a while, but Suffice to say that number one is to up your water game. Now, I'm going to recommend that you drink a glass of water with breakfast, a glass of water with lunch, 
and a glass of water with dinner. And quite honestly, I do not think that's asking too much of you. Then I want you to insert one glass of water between breakfast and lunch and one glass of water between lunch and dinner. That's five large glasses of water and you're consuming the majority of it in the first half of your day and you're putting a relative stop to fluid intake after the dinner hour. This is gonna keep you fluid hydrated and it's gonna help you not continue to make urine when you're in bed trying to sleep, thereby cutting down on waking up and trips to the bathroom, which interrupts your sleep hygiene. So number one, up your water game. Just before we move on, do me a favor. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Also, if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to the channel. It helps out the algorithm and lets YouTube know that you like what I'm doing. Number two is to supplement low levels of vitamin D. So in specific, I like to supplement with D3 because I feel like it's better absorbed in the human body. Now we can check a blood level. There's a blood test called a vitamin D 25 OH. And we want the range to be above 50, but below 100. The data is really compelling that if your vitamin D is below 50, it increases the risk to develop MS. And it would appear that if you have MS, it speeds the disease up. And so supplementing low levels of vitamin D3 is a really good idea. Now, how exactly do you do that? Well, one way is you can sun yourself because we absorb the sun and there's reactions in our skin that literally create vitamin D. If you go out in a halter top for 15 minutes in full sun, you'll create about 5,000 international units of D3. Now in Ohio, it's freaking cold outside and I doubt seriously my patients and their families are gonna run around near shirtless in the freezing winter. Oftentimes there's another way to do it and that's to take a supplement. And there are a lot of over-the-counter supplements of vitamin D3. That's number two, supplementing vitamin D. Number three has to do with processed foods. Heavily processed foods are, in my opinion, near poison. They are filled with high fructose corn syrup, which spikes your insulin, and they have a lot of chemicals and preservatives and taste additives. In essence, when you're eating a heavily processed food, you're being tricked. It's not a cheeseburger if it's coming from a fast food restaurant. There is so much stuff in that meat, which is not food. Same thing with the bun. If you're eating a frozen pizza, for example, which is delicious, if you read the ingredients, it's not delicious. It's a bunch of chemicals and preservatives and a bunch of high fructose corn syrup. And so number three is really trying to avoid heavily processed foods. Now I'll be honest with you, that is very, very hard to do. It really requires you to become knowledgeable about what you're eating. If you look at the ingredients of something and you can't pronounce the words, that's not food, that's a chemical, and I'm gonna ask you not to eat it. As a pro tip, we want you to shop on the perimeter of the grocery store. On the perimeter of the grocery store, that's where you're gonna find whole foods and fresh foods and natural foods. In the center of the grocery store, that's where you're gonna find the heavily processed, high chemical burden foods really in the center of the store. And so you wanna spend time on the outside of the store. The more you look into this, the more you're gonna realize that the vast majority of the food that you get at any fast food joint and at any convenience store and in the center of the grocery store is a heavily processed food that really I would like you to avoid. I'm looking for you to eat things that have ingredients like apple, fish, chicken, broccoli. Those are things that you can pronounce and there's a good reason for that. And so number three, after we work on the water game and upping our vitamin D is to avoid heavily processed foods. Number four doesn't have to do with what you eat, it has to do with when you eat. And this is a relatively new learning for me, something I was not taught in medical school. I'm gonna throw a video link up above to a video I did a few weeks ago where I shared my journey doing intermittent fasting. I recently lost over 30 pounds and I've kept the weight off and I feel super awesome. And I did it by changing when I eat as much as I changed what I ate. It was really a very eye-opening experience for me. And as I've been talking to families impacted by MS and trying to help people with MS clean up their eating, one of the areas that I was neglecting was asking them about when they eat. Here's the deal. When you eat something, it spikes your insulin. And when your insulin is elevated, that's the storage hormone. So it tells your body, we need to store anything that you put in us. So if you eat food after you've spiked your insulin, the food has two options. It can be burned as calories right then, or it can be stored as fat. When insulin is high, you cannot burn fat. So lipolysis is off the table. Now, what I found that I was personally doing is I was snacking all day long. Start my morning at five with cream in my coffee, spiking my insulin, eat a little Danish when I get to work, munch on some stuff I found on the conference room table, maybe eat a little bit of lunch, maybe not. I'd go home and I would eat literally 
literally until I'm embarrassed to say midnight. I was constantly keeping my insulin level elevated and anything I ate, I was put on my belly. Now, when I started to do intermittent fasting myself, I eat from noon until eight and then I don't eat any calories from eight until noon, the pounds fell off and what I was losing was fat. I challenge people listening to this video to ask yourself a simple question. How often are you eating? Or better yet, how often are you resting from eating? And if you find like me that you're essentially keeping your insulin spiked up by eating all day long, that may be a major component to challenges in trying to control your weight. I'm not suggesting that you all do intermittent fasting, but I am challenging you to try cutting out snacking. If you limited your intake to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if we just started there and you cut out the snacks between breakfast and lunch, you're gonna give your body time for the insulin level to start to drop so that when you put food in your mouth, you can burn it, but you can also burn your own fat stores. And I really think paying attention to the when about eating is maybe as important as the what. You may be wondering, when's he gonna talk about MS diet? When's he gonna tell us, should we eat meat? Should we eat dairy? Yeah, are fruits good? And I'm not gonna answer those questions. I'm gonna challenge you instead to, to try what I've suggested. Try upping your water game, making sure that you're supplementing vitamin D, avoiding heavily processed foods, and paying attention to when you eat. If you do those four simple things, I think that you're gonna find some amazing changes in your body, not just to your metabolism and your weight, but also to your energy, to your thinking and memory, to your balance, to a bunch of things right, that are guys. super duper important. If you'd like to hear some more information on MS and diet, definitely click the video. All right, that was really, really fun for me. Thank you very much for watching that video with me. It's probably the first time that I've ever had a chance to do that with you, so thank you. And uh, for those of you that have seen it already, um, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to watch it again with me. Let's take some questions about that video. Questions about MS diet, the video. So let's spend a few minutes and specifically ask questions related to that video. So if you saw something on the video that was interesting to you, if you wanted to discuss any of it, let me know. Uh, you tell me that my volume is low and I will try to pick up my voice. Chip, I hope you can hear me okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this video. I shared a bunch of information. Um, I talked about uh, upping your water game, of course, supplementing vitamin D, talked about intermittent fasting, which is uh, kind of a, a new and big deal to me. There's a lot going on in that video, and I really like to know what kind of resonates with you. So you can hear me well, that's great. What questions do you guys have um, about that video that I shared? I put that out maybe last week, I think. So if you have a question about the video, so Celia shares that fasting has been helpful to her. Um, Matt shared earlier that he really found uh, that it was working. He had lost some weight. Um, Angelus here says, can there be different hours? Yes. So let's talk about that, Angelus. So intermittent fasting doesn't have to be done at a set time. The goal with intermittent fasting is that there's a period when you eat stuff, and then there's a period when you don't eat stuff. So for example, what works best for my lifestyle is I eat from noon until 8 p.m. But you can shift that. So for example, I shift that on the weekends. If I would like to have a drink or have something to eat a little bit later, I might eat until 9 p.m. and then I fast until 1 p.m. the next day. So the important part here is that there's 16 hours where I'm not consuming calories because that allows me time for my insulin level to fall back down, hopefully to like a lower normal range. And when my insulin level falls, that's the storage hormone. So when the storage hormone goes down, then that means that I can start to burn my own body fat um, and, and I can use lipolysis. And that's what I did to lose about 35 pounds and I've kept it off for a couple months and I'm really excited about it. Um, Cynthia asks, what does intermittent fasting mean for an MS patient? So it means a lot of things. First of all, my first question was, is intermittent fasting safe for people impacted by MS? And the answer, fortunately, is yes, intermittent fasting is in fact safe. The, the data on that, I shared a little bit of that data in a video I did a couple weeks back, but the most compelling data that I saw was really fun. It was done in a country where most folks are Muslim and they practice the holiday of Ramadan. For a month, they don't eat when it's light outside and they only eat in the evening when, they can't, when it's dark. 
And so if you think about it, for thousands of years, a group of people have been fasting for 12 hours and eating for 12 hours, roughly. And some of those people have MS, and that's been studied and reported on. And the folks impacted by MS that participated in that form of fasting didn't have an increased attack rate. They didn't have, um, they didn't have progression of disability. Uh, Eustace says, let's start Ramadan right on. And, and so that's really compelling. Um, and we saw other data that says the exact same thing. Um, and so I do think that it's safe in the setting of MS. Now, of course, you need to talk to your doctors specifically about your own situation because there may be a specific situation which would necessitate uh, something different. And so I don't want to make a blanket statement like it would fit for every single person. Um, Cynthia asks another question, can intermittent fasting be mixed with other diets? Yes, intermittent fasting is not a diet. It's not about what you eat. It's about when you eat. So what I've been doing is I've been trying to apply the rules that I ask you guys to apply and avoid heavily processed foods and fried foods. I'm also trying to avoid a lot of carbohydrates because carbohydrates um, are kind of rough for me. And so I'm not, I'm not doing like a strict uh, keto diet or something like that, but I try to avoid bread if I can or pasta if I can, stuff like that. And so that's the diet that I'm using. And I'm also using intermittent fasting. And so yes, you can mix it up. Now, your earlier question, Cynthia, you asked about what does it mean for someone with MS? And one of the things that it means for MS is it's a way to control your weight. So the, the classic teaching in uh, American medical schools is eat less, move more. And that's how they recommend you lose weight. And that's what I was taught in med school. And that doesn't work. And if you are motorically challenged, so you, your legs are weak, uh, or for whatever reason, you can't just go out and run, it can make it really, really challenging to move more in a way of raising your metabolism to burn calories. A lot of people find that they're not able to mobilize uh, with enough exercise to burn calories. And then what people try to do oftentimes is they cut back on their eating. They're still eating and they may be eating all day long, but they're, they're trying to eat less. The problem with that is when you eat less, your metabolism slows down. And so as you cut back on food, your metabolism slows down because your body doesn't have any food. Intermittent fasting is different. You're not cutting back on what you're eating. You're just doing it during a set block of time followed by a block of fasting. Um, and so that's been really, really compelling. Um, and it's been a great learning for me. So Joy writes in, I'm gonna start January 1st. Uh, I'll eat one piece of cake during the eating period um, during the eight hours of eating. Cake is delicious. <laughs> um, so Hannah writes, how do you stick a diet without processed food when processed food is the most affordable. And so that's a really, really important point. Um, it's challenging to eat whole foods. It's challenging to eat single ingredient foods like chicken or broccoli. And one of the pro tips is to eat on the outside. You want to do shopping at the outside of the grocery store. So you want to shop around the edges. That's where you're going to find fresh food and whole food and all that kind of stuff. In the center of the grocery store, it's not refrigerated, um, and those are boxes and cans which will never spoil because there's a lot of chemicals and, and other ingredients. And if you're reading the uh, label on something and you can't pronounce the words or don't know what the words mean, then that's not a food, that's a chemical, and I would recommend you don't eat it. Now, Hannah, your point is very well taken. Um, it can be more expensive to do that because it's relatively inexpensive uh, to get some processed foods. But I think if you're planful, you buy some, like say lentils, for example, that's very inexpensive. You can buy some fresh fruit. There's a, there's a host of things that you can do. Um, Matt shares, um, try buying frozen veggies and fruit, uh, shop at Aldi. Um, I've saved so much money shopping there. Aldi is a great store for those of us in the United States. Um, it's a very, very inexpensive, but excellent grocery store. We have them in Columbus, they're really, really good. Um, Elizabeth shares that she's been making zucchini noodles as opposed to using pasta noodles. I love that. In, Flyby shares that salads are her new best friend. I'm, I'm digging that. So if there's other questions uh, or comments about this video, I would love to entertain them now. I also, again, just want to thank you guys for letting me kind of share that video with you today. That was a lot of fun for me. So here's a question uh, from Kim. Let me see if I can get Kim's question up there. She writes, in your opinion, do you believe that avoiding leptins is worth it? I eat tomatoes, cucumbers, seeds, and skins. Please don't feel like you need to answer. Well, I'm going to answer. I don't have enough data for me to tell you not to eat that. And if your 
eating fresh fruits and vegetables, I'm feeling really positive about that. So I can't look you in the eyes and say, no, 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 please don't do that. I, I actually think it's a really good idea. Um, so MS Dude says canned veggies and beans are also not so good. Well, it depends on the salt content, right? And so you're, you're going to need to become uh, savvy about reading labels if you're going to try to clean up your diet. It's a very hard thing to do. And so Julie Weber talks about this term autophagy. Uh, and since that didn't make it on the screen, I'll type this out for you. Autophagy and MS. So Felicia says, hello, she's late. Felicia, don't worry about it. It's great to see you. So let's talk about this concept of autophagy. So there's that word autophagy. So auto is self. Phagy means eat, so eating yourself. And autophagy is something that uh, scientists just won the Nobel Prize for just a couple years ago. And what happens Autophagy is your body's way of cleaning up debris. So during certain states, your body will start to eat, not your muscles and your skin and stuff, but eat like uh, cellular debris. It kind of cleans up uh, your body. And you can enter into autophagy through intermittent fasting. It's not going to happen if you fast 8 or 10 hours, but if you fast 16 hours, you're probably going to be in autophagy for a couple of hours. And there's some really, really cool theories behind why, and there's some really cool data supporting it. One example that I thought was awesome, a lot of people when they diet, if they're, if they're heavy and they lose a lot of weight, they have a lot of excess skin. And there's even been people that need to have like a surgery to have the excess skin removed. If you lose weight through intermittent fasting um, and you enter into autophagy, you're literally eating that excess skin and oftentimes you don't have the flabby skin hanging out, which I think is really cool. If you're not familiar with autophagy, I definitely would take a look at it. Now, Joe asks a most excellent question. He says, wait a second. I take meds at 9 a.m. What should I do? Now, if you have to take medicines at a certain time, that's very important. And we need to look into what the medicines are and whether they need to be taken with food. And so I would talk to your doctor and go through the medicines that you take at 9 a.m. And if there's a medicine that you're supposed to take without food, that's easy. If there's a medicine that you're supposed to take with food, you can game out with your doctor ways around that. Now, I'm going to give you um, an example, Joe. If you're doing a fast and you eat fat, pure fat, it will not spike your insulin. So your insulin doesn't go up and therefore you don't go into the storage mode. And so interestingly, eating a, a small amount of fat is not going to trigger um, all those bad things that we're working to avoid by fasting. And so one potential way to game it out, and you can talk to your doctor about this, is you could take the medicines that you need with, say, like a piece of cheese, right? So just pure fat. And it's an interesting way to try to, to, try to address that. But you bring up a really important point because we oftentimes will take people have, um, we'll ask people to take a medicine, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And here I am asking you to avoid breakfast. All right. So let's take one more question about intermittent fasting and about upping your water game. Speaking of upping your water game, um, today I'm really enjoying this carbonated water. Uh, this is not a commercial. I'm not being paid by this company. I just really like this water. And so if you have your water, MS Water Challenge, guys, drink up. Ah. Oh, that was delicious. Now, I'm going to shift gears again as we go through this live stream. And what I would like to do now is discuss an article that really, really got me fired up. So I'm going to change the screen around one more time. And I wanted to discuss this research article with you. Now, please give me some feedback after we're done with this segment. Let me know if you like uh, this discussion and this is a great format for you or if it was not so awesome. So this is a paper that came out, uh, I think, earlier this week. I think I read it earlier this week. Discontinuation of MS disease modifying therapies is associated with disability progression, regardless of prior stable disease and age. Now, that is a very important title. Now, this article was written by some, some colleagues of mine. Most of the folks uh, here are at Stony Brook. Um, they're in Buffalo, New York, uh, in a powerhouse MS center. Lauren Krupp, uh, Robert Zvadinoff. These are some really, really big names in MS, Dr. Gooden. Um, and really, they were, they were looking at the, uh, the MS consortium of MS centers in New York. And so let me show you the abstract. And so this is the abstract. And I want to read through it with you guys and then kind of talk through it with you. 
Background. Multiple sclerosis patients uh, with stable disease course might view continuing medicines as unnecessary. However, guidelines regarding discontinuation are lacking. Now, I want to comment on that because what I see most oftentimes is not a stable person with MS asking to come off their drug, but an MS doctor nonsensically asking a stable MS patient to come off their drug. And my immediate comment is, well, wait a second. If you're stable, maybe it's because the drug's working. And it is not my recommendation that you stop your drug. In fact, I really have an issue with that, which is why this article was so impactful to me. Now, the objective of this study to assess the clinical course of treatment discontinuation. So they, they're gonna take drug away and they're gonna watch and see what happens. So let's tune in. Now here's how they ran the study. So they were looking for people with MS who had stopped their disease modifying therapy. And when they looked at all of their databases, they found 216 humans. So that's a lot of humans with MS that were part of this consortium in New York. And they followed these folks who had stopped their medicine for on average uh, almost five years, 4.6 years. Now, leading up to stopping the medicine, they had to have stable disease course. And they defined that as their disability scale, and that's called the EDSS, had not increased, right? So that was the rule that leading up to the time you stopped, you couldn't have a worsening of your MS. So these are people that stopped their medicine after being stable. So stable and worsening patients were then assessed after the DMT discontinuation. So they stopped the medicine and then they followed them along and they looked and saw what happened. And then based on um, the, some other questions they had, they then did some further testing, right? And that's what they're talking about, this further analysis. Now, let's take a look at what the research showed. So of the 216 people that stopped the medicine, 72 of them were stable before they started the stopping, right? So the majority of these people were entering into stopping their medicine with stability. They were not having worsening of their MS. Now, after they stopped the medicine, 53 of people, so 33% that had previously been stable, became worse. They worsened on their EDSS. They didn't have an attack, they got worse. Their neurological examination worsened. So they developed neurological disability. And that's not okay. And then you see that 40% of the previous stable, stable people progressed and after they had stopped their medicine. Over two years after stopping the medicine, the rate of worsening became similar whether you were older or younger. And people that already had the need for a cane, so they had progressed in their disability up to the point where they were using a cane, when they stopped the, uh, the drug, they were more likely to get worse. And so the conclusion of this article is that MS patients with a stable disease course experience worsening after they stop their medicine. And it doesn't matter how old they are, and it doesn't matter what kind of MS they have, but if they are are progressed in their disability already, already using a cane or a walker, they get worse more. And so this article really made a point that is very, very important to me, that I do not recommend stopping your MS medicine. Um, and so I wanted to share that article with you, both to kind of share with you how we develop and discuss MS research, but also to make the very important point that I want you to be five for five in your fight against MS. And number one is to take a medicine and make sure it's working. So thanks for going through that with me. Let's take a couple questions about this article, uh, something that you might wanna ask or for some clarification. I'll throw up the title there. Uh, and so the first question comes from Mia. It says, so Pira, so is this progression um, independent from relapse activity? Yes, you could call it Pira. And what they're seeing is when they stopped the medicine, that got worse. So. Super Snazzy writes, I've seen a lot of people go off their DMT in older age. It always shocks me when someone with MS, uh, no DMT, um, but I try not to pass judgment. And that's fair. I mean, everybody's an individual. And if you choose to do something, that's your decision as an adult. I guess from my vantage point, I want you to know that if you stop your medicine, there's a high likelihood that you'll get worse. And maybe the reason that we've achieved stability is because the medicine's working. And so this article really speaks to me. It's written by some outstanding MS neurologists. I mean, Bianca Weinstock Gutman is a powerhouse in this field. These are great, great articles and really, really makes a very, very important point. Um, Lemon Peel Angelfish says, that was great. Thank you, Lemon Peel. I appreciate the comment. All right, 
So now we're gonna move on to our next segment. And what I would like to do now is I wanna go through one more very, very short video. Now this is actually a video that I made this morning. Uh, and so if you haven't seen it yet, I'm really excited that I get to watch it with you. It's very short, it's only like two and a half minutes. If you haven't seen it, uh, buckle in, let's take a sip of water and then we can fire it up. Sorry, I mispronounced your name, Maya. All right, let's do it up. If you could answer this one question, it will change everything. If you would answer this one key question, it would enhance and augment and solidify one of the most important intimate relationships that you may have in your life, the relationship with your MS neurologist. That relationship, whether you recognize it or not, is in fact an intimate relationship. You tell your MS neurologist things that you probably don't tell your spouse or your priest. And that neurologist helps you game out how to live your very best life despite having this nasty disease. What are your life goals? What are your life goals? What do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do? Do you want to climb Monte Picchu? Is it your goal to finish your master's degree? Do you want to learn how to sail? Do you want to open up a franchise? Are you planning on writing a children's book? I need to hear from you what your life goals are. Why? Because I need to know why as a team, why are we fighting against MS? I need to know what your goals are so I never allow MS to interfere with those goals. I ask as a homework assignment with all new consultative visits to write down three to five long-term life goals. And at our second meeting, I read through them and talk through them with the family. And I literally write them in the electronic medical record. And I tell the patient, we're gonna come back and visit these sometimes. We may run into a situation where I ask you years later to please do some physical therapy and you say, eh, I don't really want to. You told me that you wanted to climb Monte Picchu. How are you gonna climb Monte Picchu if you're not doing your physical therapy? I challenge you to write down three to five long-term life goals. Take that piece of paper into your MS neurologist and say, hey doc, I've been doing some introspection and reflection on my life. I've come up with some goals and I really wanna share them with you as my team member. And it's my sincere hope that that neurologist will be a good listener. My name is Aaron Boster and I truly want you to live your best life despite having MS. And I think a few moments to answer this one key question will help a tremendous amount in buttressing and enhancing your relationship with your MS neurologist. I think that's important. If you'd like to hear other tricks and tips and life hacks to live your best life despite having MS, click the video that's on your screen right now. As always, my name's Aaron Boster and thank you for learning about right. MS with me. Be safe and take care. What are your life goals? So thank you for letting me share that little video with you. Um, I, I put that out this morning and I really think it's very important. So if you have some comments, if you think that's a weird suggestion or if that's something that really resonates with you, I'd love to hear kind of what you think. I'll give a few minutes in case you have any questions about that video. And of course, thank you for watching it with me this evening. So Amanda says something very nice. Um, she says, I, you know, she likes me because I care, and, and I do care. Um, I care a lot, and it's an honor to be able to work uh, with families and try to help them live their very best life despite having this nasty disease. So thank you for that. Ben says that he really liked the video. So I wonder, Ben, if, if you would be willing to go to your MS neurologist and say, hey, I've written down some life goals. Can I share them with you? Desiree says she wants to try to find a neuro that she likes. So Dada shares to be able to have quality time with my spouse and son despite progression and visibly impaired, visual impaired now. So Maya writes, I want to be 60 ambitious as a 30 year old me. That's awesome. So she writes, I, I don't have clearly defined goals. Uh, having to come up with something when it isn't not really relevant would make me deeply uncomfortable. Well, I, I wanna challenge you. It's okay to be a little deeply uncomfortable, but I think it's important to think through some life goals. Even if you don't share them with anyone, I challenge you to write them down on a piece of paper and you can throw the paper out or put it in your desk. But I think going through that experience of writing down some life goals is a really, really good exercise. 
So Felicia writes, I just want to be clear. If you already have, as an example, issues using Walker, Kane, cognitive issues, does medication really stop the progression, even though you're taking medication? Yes. So in that article I just showed you, in people that were stable, if they stopped their medicines, they progressed. And if you have some progression, it, it even makes the stakes higher. Why would want you to be on a DMT? Because we don't want that progression to speed up. So yes, I do think it's very, very relevant. So this is all the things that I had planned. I have to tell you, I've, I've really been looking forward to trying to launch this live stream. I've had some help from family and getting uh, things working right. And let's wrap up today by doing uh, Ask Me Anything Q&A. So Ask Me Anything MS Q&A. All right, guys. So Susie Q says, funny that you ask right now. I've been struggling with this. I'm 60 and I want to be able to do things I could do five years ago. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Ask me anything, guys. So Jason says, I've been looking at your videos for the past two weeks. Um, I want to be an artist. That's fantastic. I love that. So... Ben says, can you recommend an exercise program, uh, an exercise routine for five for five? And Ben, I absolutely can. In fact, let me do a little teaser. Next month at the end of January, when we do our next live stream, I'm gonna be making an awesome announcement because that's when we're gonna go live with Total MS, powered by the Boster Center. We, it's an online virtual program, uh, specifically made for people impacted by MS at multiple different exercise levels. There are some geniuses that are both exercise physiologists, uh, dedicated exercise gurus, and neurophysical therapists that have constructed this with us. And it's something that we're gonna be rolling out. It's, a, it's commercially available. I think it's gonna start off at $19.95 a month, pretty affordable, I hope. And it's gonna be a really great custom opportunity for people impacted by MS to exercise. And so I've been working on that behind the scenes quite a bit recently, and I'll be bringing that out to share with everyone at next month's live stream. So Jen McGraw writes, with or even without clear progression, how do I really know your EDSS scale? I find I have trouble knowing where I am. So Jen, that is a great question to ask your MS neurologist. So when you see your MS neurologist, you say, hey, what's my EDSS? What's my disability score? And that should prompt a discussion. If they haven't done a full neuro exam of recent, then they can do a neuro exam at that time and they can tell you your disability status scale. They can tell you where you are on that number. I also find looking at functional testing like timed 25 foot walk, Simple digit modality tests, the nine hole peg tests are very, very helpful and, and maybe even in some ways more helpful in assessing progression of disability. So Ashley says, I'm on Ocrevus. Let me, oh, I just lost your question, Ashley, I'm sorry. Oh, darn it. Um, here we go. Um, I'm on Ocrevus. Why am I experiencing more extreme pain in an area where my lesion is? So I don't have enough information to be able to answer your question, Ashley, I'm sorry. And guys, please remember that I can't diagnose or, or treat you on the interwebs. It works best if you ask generalized questions. So Desiree says, you've been belching. Do you have a sour stomach? No, I just keep drinking carbonated beverages. I apologize. So Felicia says, what MS medicines are good for those who want to get pregnant in a couple years? That is a really, really good question. Um, I have a YouTube video on pregnancy and MS that I hope that you check out. And that's a good thing for me to bring to a future live stream. Just to answer your question briefly, the party line is don't take medicines during, during pregnancy. And that was what we were taught when I was coming up through the ranks. We've gotten a little bit more savvy now, and we now understand that it's safe to stay on your Copaxone or your Interferon products, your Avonex, Rebif, Betaseron, Extavia, et cetera, Plegerty. Those are medicines you can stay on during pregnancy. I personally am comfortable keeping women on Tysabri during attempts at conception in the first trimester, and we need to stop after the first trimester. Basically, with almost, no, not with almost, with every drug, I have a pregnancy plan for when it is safe to conceive. And the key element here is not which drug's which. The key element is 
to be proactive in talking to your MS neurologist and saying, hey, listen, um, here's the date. I'm thinking about getting pregnant in a year or two or three or whatever. And so let's game out how we pick our medicines so that we're prepared to do that. That's a very, very important conversation. When I train MS fellows and MS nurse practitioners, I tell them the right time to ask about pregnancy is when you shake their hand and meet them because it's such an important part of life and we need to know what's going on and we need to fit our medicines around those goals. The good news is it's getting easier and easier to treat MS in pregnancy and so there's a lot of options. That's a great question, thank you. Looking for other questions here. So the Rev writes, my neuro said that high dose steroids only speed up the recovery and that would happen anyways, is that true? And so that's actually a really great point. The party line, the old school idea, is that you're gonna get uh, better faster with steroids, but you're not gonna get more better. And that doesn't make any sense. What's happening with MS is that you have inflammation inside your brain and it's eating the brain tissue. So it's eating away at the myelin, it's eating away at the axons. And if it's, le if it's left alone, the inflammation can grow, right? And can take up more brain and cause more brain damage. And so quelling that inflammation has to be preserving the reserve. And it's my opinion that those old studies that suggested that you got as good as you were gonna get anyways, even if you didn't take steroids, it just took longer, they were, it was insensitive to pick up the subtleties of what we now understand. A lot of that data came from optic neuritis, where they said, well, the visual acuity was the same you know, six months later, no matter whether you took steroids. Well, number one, you want to take steroids so that you can see again quicker. But number two, I think now with more savvy understanding, we would realize that, that leaving it alone causes more damage. Even if the, the vision is about the same, there's more structural damage, which I do not want for you. Please keep in mind that the damage that you have from an attack, you pay twice. You pay at the time you have it. And then 15 years later, as your brain ages and the areas wear out, you can have progression which recapitulate the old injuries. And so giving someone steroids to quell the inflammation, to minimize the damage, I think helps twice. It, it speeds up recovery, but it also preserves the neurologic reserve. It, it preserves the brain tissue so that there's more brain tissue. There's more reserve as you age. So this is a really interesting question from Super Snazzy, who writes, what are your thoughts on how the media portrays MS? Like Selma Blair or Jack Osborne. Uh, do you feel it's beneficial or harmful since average people with MS don't have the money that celebrities do? So I have very mixed feelings about this. On one hand, I think press about MS is helpful because it normalizes having the condition. This is not a rare condition. This autoimmune disease affects one out of 350 people. There's a million human beings in the United States with MS. So that's a lot, so it's not rare. And a lot of people don't know much about it. And so if there's a, a TV commercial about a MS medicine, if there's a TV show like The West Wing where the president, the character who is playing the president of the United States, that person on the TV show had MS, or if Selma Blair or Jack Osborne are talking about the fact they have MS, there's a value there because it helps normalize the condition. If you guys think back to like, I don't know, the 90s, the late 80s, when we first saw depression commercials. So I remember some of these commercials uh, talking about antidepressants. It's my opinion that those commercials helped normalize depression. They basically taught people, look, your neighbor could be depressed, you could be depressed. It's not uh, a plague and it's treatable. And in a similar fashion, I think bringing attention to MS, making it in the forefront of people's minds is wonderful because that increases society's sensitivity, that will help um, in many, many ways. Now, I said I have mixed feelings because I'm not always sure that I agree with what the celebrities with MS say. So for example, Selma Blair took a path to treat her MS, which is not traditional. It's not only that she has money that someone else might not have, but she, she has access to things that other people might not have. And, and we don't know the full story of what's going on with her MS. So I'm delighted that she's comfortable publicly sharing that she has the condition, and I hope that it makes people feel more at ease. But I also think that we have to keep in mind that we love Selma Blair not because of her deep knowledge of autoimmune diseases, but because she's an awesome actress. And 
when I think through, sometimes I'll, I'll think through, what if I saw Selma Blair somewhere? And then I go through in my head, oh, I would run over and shake her hand and I would say hi or I'd tell her that I'm an MS doctor. And then I think, no, no, I wouldn't do that at all. She's a human being and she's probably going somewhere with her family and doesn't need me bothering her. And so I, what I decided is if I saw Selma Blair, I wouldn't do anything. I would just leave her alone because she deserves to be left alone. I, 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 again, I think it's important that we talk about MS. And I think it's awesome that Jack Osborne uses his, his fame to, to let people know that people have MS. Um, I had a unique experience um, uh, talking to a celebrity with MS years ago. Um, one, uh, and, and it was a really, really interesting uh, experience. Um, he is uh, a famous person from a famous family. Uh, they're all musically oriented and talented. And I shared a stage with him and, and he talked about his experiences and I was really, really moved. Um, he talked about, um, and this is uh, uh, the Osman. Um, and so I'm, I'm blanking on his first name, which is embarrassing as I sit here on this live stream, but he, he, he came and we shared a stage and we talked and he talked about uh, in his first presentation when he had transverse myelitis and he couldn't move one arm and he couldn't move his legs and he's sitting in a wheelchair. Now, this is a guy that plays, plays guitar for a living and he couldn't use his guitar and he also couldn't get up out of the chair. And he, he was at a holiday, so he was at like a Christmas, I think he said, and he was watching his son wrestle on the ground with his brother. And he got mad. He got mad because he said, why is this happening to me? What the heck? I don't deserve this. He was sharing his feelings. And then he had a moment where he realized, wait a second, I don't get to pick and choose. If I take away the fact that I developed MS. I have to take away every other thing in my life that's ever happened, all the good. And that really, really moved me. Um, it was such a powerful message. And I don't think it just applies to MS. I think it applies to everything. Um, and it was really, really cool to see his spirit. So I was, I was really proud of that, uh, that, that experience. So Desiree writes in a question, are they using their platforms to spread awareness? Um, all awareness is good. Yep, I, I agree with you. I think using a platform to spread awareness is a really good idea. And that's what I try to do on YouTube. I try to educate, energize, and empower. I want to help people and families impacted by MS live their best life. And so I try to, to use this platform for that purpose. Now, it's 736. I have had an absolute wonderful time. Thank you so much for joining me on this live stream. Uh, I, I hope that all the different um, doodads that I brought weren't overwhelming. Uh, and please, in the comment section below, let me know your thoughts. Um, let me know your thoughts on this format. I will do another live stream at the end of January, and of course, we'll publicize it on all the social media so that you know when and where. And we're going to be talking about a lot of exciting things, including this exercise program that I'll be launching during that live stream. My name is Aaron Boster, and as always, I want to thank you for learning about MS with me. I hope that you have a fantastic holiday. Do me a favor as we wrap up, go ahead and flame up the chat for me. I haven't asked you to do that much. Let's try to do that together today. Also throw some flames and you guys throw up some flames. All right, thank you everyone. It's been an awesome evening. God bless, take care, and I'll see you next month.